Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to team meeting number 77. We're at 77 already. I really can't believe that when we started this, that we did 77 now. We're like, whatever happened? Uh, so today on today's team meeting, we're going to be discussing uh, Medium, our, uh, what's it, our, uh, our uh, Ed Revolution uh, publication on Medium. Uh, we're going to be talking about new onboarding policies or procedures. And um, we have, I, I'm, I have a suggestion for a discussion, which I saw a very interesting piece by uh, MIT Media Lab, which we might have time for at the end. And uh, so, Rob, how's your weekend? Uh? It was good. Um, spent a lot of time with the kids, um, which was fun. Uh, uh, Leah was um, leading a backpacking trip in the um, in the Green Mountains, and uh, so I was, um, you know, back at the home front. Um, you know, making stew and doing all the, you know, the homebody stuff, which was fun. Um, and yourself? Yeah, and I did uh, some interesting stuff. I, uh, uh, it was so interesting, I can hardly remember what I did. What did I do again? Um, I've, oh, yeah, we made apple pie yesterday. It was delicious. Uh, we had, uh, uh, um, I, I did so many things, but it really just kind of just, just completely packed, a fun packed weekend. Played so much with my children. Uh, amazing. Played on the piano. Yeah, oh, did I, did I tell you we have a piano now? No. We have a piano. We have a, I got a piano from that thing. Excellent. Uh, yeah, in in the Netherlands. So you, go ahead. Oh no, in the Netherlands uh, now is the practice. Uh, you can uh, what's it? They they give away pianos online. On the on eBay, you can basically get on the Dutch version of eBay, you can get free pianos, as long as you can, as long as you pay for the transport. <laughs> You're kidding! Is no, no, it no. some it's some crazy government program, or it's just something no, that no, people no, do? No, 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 it's because because everybody lives in town, and uh, having a piano is noisy and it takes up a lot of room. So everybody's replacing their old pianos with the digital these digital ones. I say okay. the digital. I mean the proper ones that you can still feel, but they're all electronic. So you can so you don't they don't take as much space up, and uh, and of course because of that nobody wants a, a huge piano. So uh, um, yeah, I haven't seen any any grand pianos yet uh, going for uh, going for nothing. But all the standing pianos you can get them. Uh, yeah, they, they I think they throw, they uh, what's it, they give they pretty much give them for free, uh, or even even almost new ones. So get them. Uh, yeah, the standing pianos. Um, uh, we've got one. Um, Austin, my eldest, uh, plays piano and clarinet and saxophone, and he's always on it. We're trying to avoid. We do have a um, like a synthesizer, one of those uh, you know cheap keyboards, but trying to keep them, trying to keep them away from that because um, I think when you're learning the the instrument, it's definitely better to have the analog, although the you know the electronic stuff is pretty good. I, I can tell you my words. Marika's father is a piano uh, is a is a pianist, and uh, he he says that's uh, one of the most important things when the children are learning piano or when people are learning piano is that they that they have to get used to how heavy it is to press piano keys. Agreed. So touch, yeah. So they were one of the really good things with these new digital uh, 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 digital pianos is that they really have the weight of piano keys, so it actually feels as if you're pushing down with full weight uh, uh, onto a pia onto a piano so it actually so you can actually still get the get the say the strength in your fingers and the strength in your arms uh, even uh, but using a lot more less space there and then you can give your piano away for free which is a good one. Well, let's get into um uh we can talk a little bit more um towards the end but we'll get into the um into the agenda so le why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, medium and uh, about the higher ed revolution yeah, well, uh, well, of course, we uh, we are in a higher education revolution. At least we decided we were, uh, and I uh, I decided that we should we should also have a look at. Uh, we've been uh, struggling for some time with with creating our own content. We have we're so busy, uh, so to regularly create content we have, uh, for ourselves or about uh, what about our our faculty members. Uh, so we decided that we set up a, a, a medium publication. Uh, we've done this before with S with SSG with Startup Study Group. I did this ages ago with uh, with one of the guys there, and we have there on that one we have something like oh, I think something like ten thousand people for uh, ten thousand people who listen to, who, who get the work together stuff there. So I thought, oh, this why am I, why in God's name am I not doing this with Plano, uh, my main gig? Yeah. So I set up the so I set up uh, uh, this uh, medium publication, which is basically no work at all. 
and started hunting around for interesting uh, interesting uh, posts on uh, education. Of course, there are a lot of uh, you have a, there are already a, quite a number of uh, education publications, and there was so there are quite uh, there are quite a number of people who are already posting things about education. But it was basically finding the finding the the good things that are left over, uh, or the, the the good things that are out there uh, which are. Slightly more radical, of course, because I, I like the slightly more radical stuff and the, the stuff that actually gets into the nitty gritty of how people want to change it, not uh, the touchy feely. Uh, yeah, we it needs to be changed, and oh yeah, we have to change stuff. So, now, really, from the nuts and bolts, you 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 propose that you want to change higher education. So, what do you want to do? What is exactly what is step one? What's going to happen on day one? Now? So, uh, so we've been getting a lot of very interesting stuff in. Also, uh, experiments people have been running. At, I talked last week about the experiment that I think it was at Berkeley or one of the other universities they had a, a hip-hop class we're going to have a in, in this week's publication or in this week's series we're going to have a discussion uh, there's uh, some other experimental class a Doctor Who class I think is going to be I have to double check it but I think this is a class on Doctor Who that they that they, he, he sets it up experimentally but how can I, you're gonna have to wait for it to get all the details on that oh, yeah or sorry something like that. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's, but it's really, really like um, amazing stuff out there for people who are looking, are looking for it and looking for inspiration, uh, to, for something to uh, what to to uh, to write about or to read about or to uh, or to apply in the classroom. Because of course, that's very important, uh, or at least I consider that very important that we also have actionable things. Uh, we are, we have things that people can actually use and can can take away and can actually uh, do something with, rather than just being uh, just being an opinion piece or a, or a. Uh, yeah, as I say, a touchy feely piece of something of uh, somebody's opinion without uh, any foundation. Without, well, it doesn't have to have a big foundation, but it uh, but it has to have at least a little bit of foundation in reality. Yeah, so um, that's all a way to um, boost up the um, the profile of a Plano in the yeah. online um, education market. You know, we are, you know, we're always trying to strike a fine line between being too radical and also having to exist within the current paradigm. So yeah, I, I like the the medium piece. Um, you know, again, uh, higher ed revolution is a great thing to subscribe to on Medium, and also um, you know, going to a plano dot com and our Woodblock, yep. which uh, you know you can see posts of um, our team meetings, and after this one is concluded, we'll post it up there, um, including some interviews that we're going to be doing in the next um, couple of weeks. Yeah, and also if if you are subscribing to the Medium. Uh, to the higher ed revolution, you'll also get all of the stuff that we also post on uh, Woodblock. So on the blog post, on the blog, because I import that also, or I include that in the, in the publication, and you get a weekly newsletter with everything that's come out, all the interesting stuff that we've created and that we've found online uh, for you to read. So let's then um, let's move on and let's talk a little bit about the uh, new onboarding procedures for brand new faculty. Um, what we've done over the past uh, couple of weeks is uh, recruit, redone our faculty um, CRM, which is sort of the back end where we keep track of people's, um, you know, files and posts. And we've spent a little bit of time walking through um, brand new faculty through a program uh, of uh, orientation and of checking in on them a whole lot more. Um, you're actually, uh, I finished a letter to all of the, um, our older faculty which you'll be getting in the next couple of days. Uh, and it's going to sort of outline why we're switching our onboarding process a little bit and about how to uh, re-engage our old faculty. Um, the faculty have been with us a long time. Um, you know, it's pretty impressive, you know, looking at the numbers, having over 40 classes that have been developed by you all. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, our seven certificate programs. But what we're doing is a slight pivot more to the marketing for institutions, which is outlined in this um, uh, in this email. The pivot to uh, really trying to work with institutions also to attract um, students and provide these institutions with content and teaching, which they need. So we're sort of um, doing a little bit of disintermediation of the whole adjunct market uh, and the way in which adjuncts you know, potentially are going to acquire classes. Uh, and the really great thing, remember, is that faculty set their own tuition rate. And um, a Plano takes 10% or $100 per student, whichever is greater. So the ability to 
deal with the adjunct um, faculty pay crisis is, is really great. Um, we're boosting up people's salaries. Now on the institutional level, um, what we're sort of seeing when we look at different companies like Pearson's and other online publication um, places is that all kinds of institutions are buying the same type of curriculum. And what that's doing is leading to both a standardization and also a commodification of um, the market. So for example, introductory classes right now um, aren't paying very much. Um, you can get great introductory classes on Coursera, Udemy, or edX, um, free software, I mean, sorry, free classes that are you know very high quality. But what isn't happening is sort of the specialized um, classes and also the more technical uh, classes where really you, you don't need to just have sort of, you know, a souped up electronic textbook. What you need is an interaction with a high quality faculty member who can um, teach you uh, through interaction the skills that you need to learn. And um, that's really the differentiation that a Plano offers that, you know, m many of the other sort of online education providers don't have, which is our small classes. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about that um, in the coming, um, you know, in the coming weeks. But uh, realize that, you know, our new onboarding procedure is designed to get your courses completed and that we can then use those completed courses as part of our catalog that we're uh, selling um, and working with um, institutions in terms of uh, saying, hey, we can provide you a great section on this subject. And we'll be working, as we work with different institutions, we can kind of aggregate those into to one section um, uh, so that, you know, a, a college may only be able to have, you know, five people from one section dealing with a course in neuroscience, but then there's another um, college or university which has another five, and so that we can put those two groups together in one section um, to have uh, 10 or 15, and again, the maximum size that we have is 25. So this is another way to acquire students we're not abandoning the um, idea of just acquiring students through um, entering our website and signing up for our courses, but we're going to be um, redesigning a bunch of those processes too as we um, get a little older and, and search for traction and all of that. Um, the next discussion. Yeah. And no, sorry, I'm go ahead. So that's how we have, because of course, I mean, um, and to, and to uh, really to show that we're not uh, abandoning this when, uh, in the background, we're still uh, for for any uh, any uh, faculty member who is who is who uh, is who wants to. I think I've a person recently about to, about, about the content promotion of co their uh, the promoting their courses. Uh, there's there's very very uh, very very advantageous for them to them. If we look at Professor Sadler and we look at uh, at uh, our. Um, the journalists, Professor, um, lost it then. Jeff okay, Morley. Professor Morley, indeed. So, if we yeah. look at Professor Morley, Professor Sandler, they really have they have a, an existing uh, they have an existing base, and uh, was it so they have an advantage uh, w when they're marketing their courses more so than when they try to reach out. But also, if you have if if a faculty member has a question that they don't just want to go the uh, the institutional route or they they want to branch out from the institutional route that they can, we can also help them up and hook them up uh, we're working on a number of ebooks and a number of uh, a number of uh, other th uh, other things in the background to help people who choose to have a, uh, choose to perhaps expand their field slightly and m maybe promote their course themselves a little bit more than uh, was it than they have than other uh, than others who want to go more the institutional path then. Yeah, you know, it's clearly going to be um, both. Both are going to be really, really important as we sort of, as higher ed transitions from um, one type of uh, marketing to another. And again, the U.S. and European markets are really, really, you know, important. But really, the growth in the in the field is going to happen outside the U.S. and outside Europe and the OECD countries, where the need for education is huge. And we're doing some things to address that also. Um, Okay, let, let's just move a little bit to the discussion of um, why don't you uh, start it off about the Medium article you published. Uh, yeah, well, it was, uh, I didn't publish it. Well, you didn't publish it, but, you know, the, the link. Yep. It comes from, uh, it comes from MIT Media Lab, and they have, uh, what's it, they did a little bit of research, or they, they did a little bit of research on the effectiveness of 
uh, online videos in uh, online learning and pedagogy. And uh, uh, it's a very interesting article. And the, and the paper that they, they back it up, also good. It was uh, very interesting also is that, of course, they have uh, the same reference uh, by coincidentally to uh, to Diamond Age by Neil, Neil Stevenson, uh, <laughs> and, uh, really, with, with a young okay. girl's illustrated primer. Yeah, which I thought was absolutely. Which I thought th this is why. Well, this is why I placed it in this. I thought this is so key. This is uh, this like uh, Plano and uh, and uh, um, and MIT Media Lab. We've got the, like the synergy going on at the moment. So we really have to. We really have to take that. But what they what they actually say is very much a lot of which, a lot of. Uh, Organizations, MOOCs, uh, online learning organizations have very much tried to, yeah, buy off the promise. I don't know. I don't know if you could, if, 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 yeah, buy off the promise of, of online education by just throwing videos out there, and uh, or, and and often, if we look at the uh, the first in, uh, installments, as we saw them on you uh, on iTunes, where uh, MIT and Harvard and a number of other Stanford put on video lectures, which were basically Two hours long. So you're watching two hours. You're watching a professor who's in his in his classroom, talking to his students without any interactivity, and see, uh, seeing seeing uh, seeing that and how uh, how online learning is progressing to bringing people of uh, bringing people smaller pieces of content. So perhaps a uh, a five minute piece of content, but of, of, uh, with uh, a very very clear goal of uh, of learning in that content. But it, does that does that lose say the uh, where is that losing the bigger the bigger picture? So there's there's somewhere there's a balance between giving people just huge lectures and turning it into uh, ent ed edutainment, uh, or giving people uh, actionable content uh, content actionable information that they can actually do something with, but without a con there where you can very easily start losing context if you're not in there if you're not in the flow only watching one one video of five minutes or ten minutes a day uh, something like that. You really you start you start to lose it, and where that where that balance is, and so there's a very very interesting piece about that, uh, which I can certainly advise people to uh, to read. Um, you should also though take a look at um, uh, read our um, the monthly update that we just uh, sent out to all of you. Um, you know it's interesting the different takes. I'm so glad I didn't read the article this article before um, I wrote that update. Um, you know it's interesting the reference to Diamond Age, uh, which we both um, uh, put on, you know, the the thing is that we have to look at technology as the tool that creates human interaction rather than the tool that just provides inter, um, information. And so the lecture format is really about providing information. But what we're really working hard to do at Aplerno is with our classes under 25 students, we really want the teacher to be involved in the Socratic and creating a learning community, a place where questions are being answered back and forth. And we use the technology to supplement that, to, to support that interaction versus using the technology to impart information. And I think where, where for example, Coursera and Udemy, and in some ways is edX, got it wrong was that they posted all of this information online, but they they um, a little bit ignored the pedagogy. You know, it's great that you know these classes sometimes register you know a hundred thousand people, and again, there's the video, and then maybe they have some discussions with uh, you know a teaching assistant, but that's not the way most of us want to learn, and most of us are effective at learning. You know, I have to when I'm learning something, I have to be shown it three or four different times. I have to you know, do it myself uh, and play around with things and then have experts that I can ask questions to and that can critique my performance. Um, when we're trying to develop, you know, with those video lectures, you know, if you just are just, you know, throwing information out, that's not where the value added is for the, for the students. Um, the value added is when you've given them a bunch of information, but then you're asking them to do something and you're critiquing that. And in faculty interactions that we're having um, with our Plano faculty, um, you know, sometimes faculty really understand that it is the human interaction that is very, very important. Others are putting, you know, up more information and then, you know, we kind of coax them back into remembering that, you know, the internet is a medium the internet is just a tool that you should be using to make interaction with your students easier, not um, information 
uh, you know, broadcasting, which is what unfortunately a lot of um, online textbooks and stuff are. Now, just quickly to go back to the illusion of Diamond Age, in the update, you know, there's this primer, this little book that's, um, you know, it's basically an iPad. And the value of the iPad is, sorry, the value of the primer is that it allows Nell, the main character, to access um, not only the, the software that makes up the primer that allows her to tell stories and helps her to learn, but it allows her to access um, uh, Miranda, the main character or act, one of the main characters or actors in the, um, in the story who uh, helps her along the way through interacting and doing things that the artificial intelligence um, in the, or what they call the pseudo AI does in the primer and as it's connected to the web, which is it teaches you potentially the skills, okay? Um, but it doesn't teach you how to apply those skills. That's the job of the, um, of the actor. That's the job of the, of the teacher. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful analogy, but let's remember that, you know, tech, our smartphones and our iPads are only as good as the content and the interaction behind them. And right now that content and that interaction has to be dominated by, and will be for a very, very long time by people, by us communicating with, um, uh, you, our faculty and you, our students and you fa and faculty can, um, communicating with students and students with faculty. So when you put that at the center, the tech is really wonderful and magical in terms of who now can participate, which is um, people from anywhere in the world. End of sermon. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I like the sermons. Uh, by the way, if uh, if you're uh, if you were wondering, uh, I've added the uh, the URL to both the up October update and to the uh, the MIT lab uh, discussion uh, or the MIT piece. Uh, or medium below in the uh, comments or in the uh, description. And read, um, you know, and if you're interested in a great read, read Diamond Age, um, because it's not really a, <laughs> it, it was a book of science fiction uh, in the past, you know, when it came out in, God, it was like 94, 95. Uh, and now it's a book of, it's a documentary of the near future, because lots that they, discuss in the book, not necessarily the nanotechnology part, but the ways in which people learn and the fact that cultural groups are becoming global in their affinities. They're not just, um, you know, local. And it's, you know, the whole file thing is P-H-Y-L-E-E -E is, you know, fascinating. And so it's a great read. And if you want to figure out where a Plano is going, uh, we're, you know, our goal is to produce the primer and this little thing right here is what you will access most of your learning um, in quite soon. And it will be high quality and, and highly interactive. So, yep. all right. Um, I think that's about it. So if you're uh, tuning in today, make sure you check your emails in the next, your email for Plano and in the next couple of days. So you get that letter um, from me if you're, Old, um, older faculty, and we will see you next week. And again, thanks a lot for tuning in, and we'll see you online. And I just want to say that be sure to tune in next week because we're going to be discussing uh, discussing a time and uh, was a time or and a date for a community meeting. So uh, please tune in next time. Uh, very important. Uh, thank you very much, and see you online. Uh. See you online.